Welcome to the second installment of our sessions on territory, collaboration between the chair of Melissa uh, Topalovic, Hans Hortig, Sasha Dels, that I don't see at, at the moment, uh, from my chair. Second session, first session was on food. Remember cooking uh, sections in which we try to address this cascade of three themes, territory, Anthropocene, and, and ecology. And we would like to continue with a similar subject matter uh, that addresses food tangentially in the context of Egypt. And this we would like to do with uh, the final book launch of a new book that was published uh, by uh, Charlotte Materba, uh, Leo Streich, Elena Schütz, and Julian Schubert from Something Fantastic from, from Berlin. And it addresses Cairo. Now, allow me a brief footnote on Cairo. Uh, we have Eduard Schwarz here from the Lafarge Holzheim Foundation for Sustainable Construction, and he's organizing a conference in Cairo. And we are partner, ETH is a partner university of the foundation, and uh, two students will be invited to attend this conference in April. So if you have a fantastic project that addresses issues of sustainable construction at the architectural or urban uh, scale, talk to me. And we will select the best posters, and those two students will be invited to uh, attend the conference in Cairo. So this is a great, great opportunity uh, for, for you. So today we would like to focus on a particular book entitled uh, Desert Cities that we would like to launch and I will show you the pre-launch that we had in Cairo beforehand uh, that somehow went sour, uh, but we have drinks at the end to celebrate the publication of uh, the book. So, but there is there is a pre-story to that book. You know, how do books come about? You know, first of all, we had already published at my chair uh, a book on Addis Abeba in Ethiopia that dealt with questions of resources. Okay? We, we looked at territory through the lens of resource, uh, resource flows, energy, information, capital, material, space, water, and people. This is the structure of the book. We had just finished that book. And we were wondering, you know, what, what we should do next. This was about 10 years ago, eight years ago. Uh, and I was at the hospital at the time. I had an appendix. You know, you're in a state of trance. And I was reading a book that Melissa had collaborated on, uh, on the Nile Valley. And what's interesting, what was interesting to me at, at the time uh, was that you were talking about limited resources. So there was apparently another colleague somewhere, I didn't know Melissa at, at the time, that was preoccupied by the idea of looking at territory through the lens of resources. So food was one theme that, for example, you heard about uh, last week. And there were two illustrations in, in this book that stuck, stuck with me, you know, when you're in a hospital and you don't know what happens with you. And it was one was informal settlements on agricultural land, so on the, on the land on which food is being produced, uh, housing, and totally new developments built somewhere outside in the desert since the 1970s, on the uh, 80s, 70s, 80s. So this stuck, stuck with me. And it was clear the book came out in 2010, so it was prepared before the Arab Spring. And we said, OK, let's go, let's go uh, to Egypt. And at the time, Charlotte Malterbart had given a lecture here in, in this room, I think, or in the Hunkerberg, on bread and the role of bread in the Arab Spring. So I thought, hmm, this is, this is very interesting. Could we bring these things uh, together? And we launched a MIS course uh, on 
Cairo and on informal settlements and later on on desert uh, cities. So those became the two subject matters. So we took up what uh, Melissa had done at the ETH Studio Basel and we went into, into depth, okay, kind of deconstruction of those two territories which led to the two books. And today we are celebrating the second book. Okay. Now, about six months ago, we, ah, here are the two themes uh, that you see, so further developments of how urbanization is taking place in Egypt, and not only in Cairo, but also in Alexandria and along the entire Nile uh, Valley. So informal settlements on agricultural land and these new type of developments that are emerging uh, in, in the desert, understood as the solution to solve the first uh, problem since it's illegal to build on agricultural land. And we will discuss this at the end in the debate. So we said we want to have a book launch in Cairo. Okay, so this is the city of Cairo. And, but what became clear is that we had to have two book launches. One in Adeleva, in, in informal settlements, and in the formal city, a second one at the Institut Francais uh, d'Egypte. So already this was mind-boggling, that the city was divided, and that if you wanted to have an exhibition and a book launch, uh, you needed to do two events. Uh, so here you see the arrival to these uh, two scenes, and Leo was there and was sending me uh, these photographs. If you want to go to the Institut, Institut Francais, D'Egypte, you are going through highly securitized uh, streets. Okay? So this is, you know, they have to protect these uh, institutions. So this is the formal city. And the informal city, the cab driver didn't want to take them there, so they had to take uh, a rickshaw, okay? which takes you, you know, back to another entirely different uh, uh, setting in which these exhibitions uh, take place. So this was the informal uh, exhibition where some people of the neighborhoods dropped by and this was the formal, look at the, the launch, the book launch with exhibition in the formal uh, city in a kind of neo-colonial uh, setting. It tells you a lot about the history of, of Egypt. But the books did not arrive. Okay, this is, so you do a book launch in Egypt with exhibitions and the books didn't arrive. Why didn't they not arrive? Okay, this is a mysterious thing. We found out that, that Customs and Security Authority uh, in Egypt, about in November, decided that we had shown maps in the book that, of settlements that officially did not exist. So there are about 10 million people living in these informal settlements, but officially they do not uh, exist. Okay? And Eddie, this is a fascinating story. They were trying to organize a tour of these informal settlements and everybody is screaming and saying, security issues, we can't go there, etc. So this is, tells you the frame of mind. Okay? And so uh, we had the choice of whether you know, the, the pages would be removed or where, whether we wanted the books back. We said, send us the books back and we remove the pages. So this is this, is this uh, small anecdote about this book. Now, this book here, this is the red one, okay, red because of the bricks. Uh, this is an image of 2013, and this is the transformation of the t territory. Sorry, it was 2003 and 2013. So this is 2003, and this is 2013, so pre Arab Spring and after Arab, Arab, Arab Spring. So a lack, a vacuum of power uh, and informality uh, increased uh, drastically. So this is the image that I showed you and this is what Charlotte will talk about in the second book that is sand color, I assume. This was the concept. Uh, and here two examples, late 1979 on the president uh, Sadat, uh, the first attempt to find a response to the informal settlements with 6th of October city, and in 2015, new capital Cairo 
was announced originally to be financed by the United Arab Emirates, and now apparently it should be financed by the Chinese. So this tells you kind of the kind of geopolitical context in which uh, this, these settlements are occurring. And so uh, what we would like to do in the debate afterwards with Leo Streich from Something Fantastic who collaborated with the book, Melissa and, and Charlotte, is to address the three themes that are the themes of the seminar, territory, anthropology, and ecology, in view of what Charlotte will present. So please welcome Charlotte Malter Bart. Um, thank you, Mark, for this introduction. Um, I will basically give a bit of a context as why uh, we are uh, experimenting this uh, type of urban development and uh, also the context of the research that, um, that we undertook when we uh, started working on these uh, this desert cities. I think it's very important that those two books are presented together because what came very clear, uh, became very clear to us was that those are, um, so the formal and the informal um, developments are basically two sides of the same coin, the uh, urbanization of uh, Egypt and Cairo. Um, so I, gi I give you a bit of, a, of context uh, before diving into the topic itself. So we are talking about uh, Egypt, which is a, a 90 million country, so like Germany, for instance, um, uh, bordering Libya, Sudan, uh, Israel, and the occupied territory. And the population is mostly settled along the Nile Valley, which is this green stripe that we, um, that we all know. And in Cairo, which is basically the very center of the Egyptian nation state, where all power structures are based. Um, this is important to highlight because uh, Egypt has, in a way, a kind of extreme geography, which... Um, which uh, helps define the uh, alarming and constructed image of Egypt as a large population country crammed into a narrow, hyper-dense area uh, that relies on scarce food, water, and land resource, a nation at its limits, basically. This is what Timothy Mitchell called a topographical imperative, uh, which has shaped national policy since 1952 to today. So the official discourse, um, as Mark was, was already mentioning, is that urban areas, so particularly Cairo, uh, have many issues such as traffic congestion, air pollution, uh, overpopulation, housing shortages, chaotic garbage collection, urban sprawl, and political instability. And the ruling uh, LCC administration, which is currently in power, declared uh, in this uh, um, report called uh, Egypt Vision 2030, the current inhabited areas have reached vital capacity and population saturation. Uh, so they're basically talking about Cairo, pretty much. Um, adding that this was leading to the deterioration of the urban environment quality, as well as the spread of random construction on the most fertile agricultural lands. Uh, again, what uh, uh, Mark mentioned earlier. So this is the official, um, uh, let's say, discourse. The solution to this is presented as being the urbanization of the desert, uh, what we investigated in the book we are launching today. And I want to start with a recent update um, on this particular topic um, in Egypt currently, but I hope there is sound. Cairo will soon be just one of Egypt's capitals thanks to a new development. The big dream is to have a new capital, which will move us away from Cairo traffic and congestion and its big problems, and fulfill a dream that many former Egyptian governments had. Egypt is building a new administrative capital. It's 45 kilometers east of Cairo and is seen as an answer to its overpopulation problems. It won't replace Cairo as the national capital, and it doesn't have a name yet. But the government and the military are expected to move there next year. Plans include homes for up to 7 million people, the largest cathedral in Egypt, and the tallest tower in Africa. It'll cost $45 billion. Around $35 billion of that will come from loans and investment from Chinese companies. Some Egyptians are cautiously optimistic about the plan, 
but they're concerned about how it'll be carried out. If the Egyptian workers find homes in the new capital close to their work, this will help relieve overcrowding in Cairo. But if Egyptian workers go work there and come back to their homes in Cairo, then this will make very little difference. Last year, market research firm Euromonitor International listed Cairo as one of the fastest growing cities in the world. The greater metropolitan area is home to around 22 million people. But the nation has suffered an economic crisis for years, including high inflation, unemployment and a decreasing water supply. Atef Salah doesn't expect the new city to help him anytime soon. The rich class will benefit from the new capital at the beginning. Later, there will be projects and housing for Egyptian youth. But we won't feel any change right now. The project is not yet fully funded, and several failed city developments already built around Cairo point to the risks of building a grand new capital. Its high housing prices will be out of reach for many Egyptians. And a major new city will only further strain Egypt's dwindling water supply. The new capital might help to steer Cairo out of a deepening crisis, but it could also drag Egypt into an even bigger one. Sarah Balter, TRT World. I, I think you heard a bit. Um, so this is the master plan of the new capital in the desert by um, uh, SOM, the uh, famous planning and architectural firm, and local planners 5 plus. If you pay attention, on the bottom left you see that it's titled the capital Cairo, Widian Green City. So we have a green city in the middle of the desert. Um, and I would like to replace this project uh, as the legacy of a long list of desert cities and within the historical context of desert development in Cairo. So the desire to escape old Cairo appears actually as early as 1870 with the creation of a thermal city in Helwan, which was connected with public transport to Cairo. Uh, and then with the creation of Heliopolis, um, which uh, is a private speculative plan on the upper right uh, by a Belgian orientalist Baron Empin, uh, which was also implementing for the first time a sewage system and of course created a, a, a Cairo electric railway and Heliopolis company, which was linking the new area to the center of Cairo with a tramway 10 kilometers away. Uh, and this is an important feature because this disappears um, as uh, we, we move into uh, more uh, desert cities, the, the kind of connectivity vanishes. So in the 60s, um, a few years after Egypt's independence, we see the construction of Nasser City, which is a, plan, uh, city, a city planned by the government for the government on desert land. Um, so it's built on a former uh, military area belonging to the Ministry of Defense and planned by Mahmoud Riyad, which was a friend of Nasser and an important diplomat we see on this, um, on this black plan. Uh, also taken from the book, uh, this kind of modernist grid. Also, it's important to uh, remember this fact that the land belongs to the Ministry of Defense because this is also something that has been, uh, uh, let's say, a fundamental mechanism of these desert cities. So Heliopolis, Helwan, and Nasser cities were uh, establishing a sort of precedent with the construction of cities over desert land. Yet the real desert development boom happens after Nasser's death in... Uh, 1970 with this uh, master plan, which is, um, was redrawn. This is a 1970 master plan. And this plan, as you see, aims at, I mean, the goal is to restrain the urban growth that followed uh, the industrialization policies uh, and attempt to divert this growth into new towns uh, on desert land, also to preserve agricultural land. So you see this um, uh, Ville Nouvelle Projeté, they are uh, the four that you see around and, and on the south. Um, so we, we are experiencing the creation of six new cities and satellite towns. Um, and uh, so the cities are 10th of Ramadan, uh, El Sadat, Badr City, 6th of October, 15th of May, that you see on the bottom, and uh, El Obor. And then 10 new settlements along uh, what would, would become the Ring Road uh, were also planned. These don't have names. They're called uh, nine settlements, six settlements, seven settlements. Um, so on this map, we see the ring road under construction. That would be the, the line, uh, like, yeah, but I, I don't have, ah, sorry. Uh, that works better. 
So here we see the, the ring road um, that will uh, enclose the city. Uh, it's actually at that time under construction um, and it follows the model of the Paris uh, périphérique as acted then in the next Plan Directeur of, of 1983, which was developed by French urban planners, uh, the Institut d'Aménagement Urbain et Régional d'Ile-de-France. So they basically exported this idea of a ring, ring road with the aim of stopping urban growth uh, inside its limits. So um, here you see, it's kind of at the end, uh, it's exactly the opposite that happened uh, because of course what happened is that they, by having a ring road here, it actually connected the exterior districts and the ring roads uh, in that sense favored urbanization over agrarian land. So uh, this is the 1997 master plan completed as you see here um, <clears throat> and we see appear some new desert cities here. This is uh, actually, um, so here we see, sorry, this is just to say, so here you have the first big development, this is 6th of October and then um, uh, New Cairo. I'm just showing you quickly, 6th of October, uh, this is the black plan. You see um, the very clear kind of guidelines. This is, for instance, the industrial area. So you see big shapes, uh, the commercial area, and then here uh, some more uh, residential areas. And here, this is actually public housing, so very uh, rigid. Um, and this is just some mood images that uh, tells a bit about the, the type of urbanization that we're encountering. El Obor, um, uh, also kind of cookie cutter uh, um, development, 15th of May, which is actually neighboring, uh, this is actually Helwan. Uh, strictly residential, so uh, built only to host um, the workers of uh, Helwan uh, steel industry, for instance, or Tents of Ramadan, which has a, a plan that reminds a little bit of uh, uh, the Black Star somehow. And then you see this kind of uh, very recognizable uh, forms, which are industrial uh, areas, and then again, this kind of repeated uh, cluster, like repeated um, urban forms, pretty much this one repeated um, endlessly. Or Al Badr, I'm just passing through. Um, some of the more recent developments were established by Mubarak um, by presidential decree. So, this is New Cairo, for instance, uh, more an upscale area. And you can tell from certain urban forms that we are in a different type of development. I'm uh, attracting your attention to this type of construction or this type, which are basically uh, single villas organized around the golf course. Um, but you also have more, uh, let's say, uh, affordable houses, though these are always fenced, so it's kind of a, a, a typical, uh, it's, let's say it's more oriented to upscale. Um, and there's also Sheikh Zaid, I will talk about it afterwards, or Madinati, which uh, was the image that Mark was showing when he showed these two uh, contrasts. This is a kind of bizarre, uh, immense and unfinished development, uh, almost 30, 30 kilometers away from downtown Cairo, with, this, again, this kind of... Uh, very repetitive form uh, of, of housing. So after Helwan, Heliopolis, and Nasser City, we also have uh, 15th of May, El Obor, 6th of October, Sheikh Zaid, uh, 10th of Ramadan, uh, Sadat City, Al Badr, New Cairo. So the trend is clear. I just want to make a point uh, that is very obvious. Uh, the, the, this kind of idea of going into the desert to, to escape Cairo and to uh, create new cities uh, is a trend that's also being pursued by the current administration um, as we have seen with the new capital project. So I will quickly outline the book itself. Um, as Mark said, it's a collaborative effort by uh, Mark, Mark himself, uh, myself, something fantastic, uh, and our Egyptian partners of Cluster, and then uh, produced, of course, by the uh, MIS Urban Design Class of 2015-2016, published by Ruby Press. The book itself uh, opens in a series of images that gives a sense of the reality of desert cities. Here you have a satellite view of a somehow typical desert city condition with these kind of unfinished lines in the sand. Um, we also uh, show some actual plans produced by uh, basically professionals from our discipline. This is a gated community in Sheikh Zayed. Um, 
few images that maybe give an idea of the scale uh, that we are actually uh, facing here and also the style and the condition. This is uh, 6th of October, downtown 6th of October, a desert city that's, uh, for instance, very bizarrely suffering from major uh, traffic congestion, even though it has very low density. So, uh, And then you're having seven buildings uh, constructed in the 70s that are, as you see, entirely empty, except here you have a few offices. Um, also, uh, quite a few public housing. So this is, for instance, 6th of October also, and uh, more like a street life. What is it maybe interesting in this image is that, um, so this is public housing, meaning uh, it's strictly residential, but of course people uh, have needs, so they break the law and create little shop um, at the lower uh, levels. Um, and then this kind of development that I mentioned earlier with the uh, villas overlooking uh, golf courses. Um, the book itself is structured in six parts. You have an intro that you actually received, uh, possibly, which is laying out the whole story with a, an excellent um, essay by Eric Denis, which tells the whole story of, of the policies. Um, then you have this chronology of 11 cities that I uh, already started to mention. We have an insight of uh, local... Um, residents, uh, architects, inhabitants, or professionals who are living and practicing in desert cities, and then a series of, a series of essays um, that try to untangle the complexity of the mechanisms behind the production of these uh, spaces. A, a section with seven projects where we are looking at some solutions, and uh, finally, an essay sections, section uh, by experts to wrap up the topic. Um, I will only show one case study very sh very shortly. This is Sheikh Zaid, as you see here. So every case study has a plan that locates it, a small storytelling. In this case, I just want to uh, attract your attention. They will be here, the initial target population when it was projected, 500,000, and then population uh, census 2060, six, six, it's 30,000 inhabitants. So. Uh, and this is pretty much the case in any of these desert cities. They have a very ambitious target and a very low uh, actual density. Uh, the floor plan, again, I attract your attention to this kind of development where you see uh, a kind of line of houses that are all oriented towards a, a, a golf course. Um, so that's also an easy way to grasp the urban features of this, uh, of this uh, type of development. Uh, we also looked at the, t the typology of, of uh, the type of architecture that is produced by this, um, by this uh, development. So you have this kind of enclosed villas or uh, residential building and uh, a context uh, plan. So this is a 1 to 1,000. As I said, again, this overlooking a, a golf and then a few images to materialize this, um, this uh, development. Here you see largely unfinished villas. Uh, people are investing, they do not trust the local, they don't trust banks, so people usually buy, invest in, in these uh, villas for their children or to resell, uh, but they actually don't live there. Uh, and then again, the scale, this is the development of uh, Alegria by uh, the firm Sodic, which is uh, in Sheikh Zayed again, as I said. So um, there are 10 of uh, uh, other cases of these cities that are following a similar outline, and I just want to show you uh, two small projects uh, that were in the alternative uh, urban futures um, to give you a bit of an idea of what we uh, tried to do. This is the project called Graft. Um, this project was trying to use the informal uh, development model, so they used the grid uh, of this informal development that Mark was mentioning and that are part of the first book to produce a more compact, well-adjusted uh, adjusted to inhabitants uh, and more climatically sustainable uh, urban development. Uh, they also, pro so this is the new development and they also pro uh, proposed a productive uh, palm production plantation to generate work and a better uh, microclimate uh, and an improved urban grid. Uh, also tapping on the resources that are currently channel channeled in desert cities. So basically water and road uh, infrastructures are paid uh, by the state to sustain private developments. Uh, also questioning the fact that the state, uh, that state-owned land is sold at very low prices to maximize uh, private companies' profit. So this is uh, uh, one of the projects that questions that. 
The other project I want to show um, argues that the poorer population that actually serves these areas, so these gated communities, even though they have low density, they are inhabited by the people who guard them or the people who maintain them, uh, kind of an army of gardeners, of concierge and guards, that should also be accommodated in a gated communities projects. And the idea is to challenge the hard boundaries that are typical to this uh, uh, kind of development. This would be the existing, and that's uh, a kind of habitable uh, fence um, that this project was um, proposing. So while the interior is not challenging so much the classical layout of the gated communities, uh, the boundaries are designed to uh, offer housing and commercial options catering to less wealthy population with um, some architectural answers that uh, work around shaded spaces um, or hosting facilities with uh, communal functions such as mosques where typically people from a different social class would interact, um, resulting in a more urban, uh, let's say, more sustainable and inclusive neighborhood. So uh, I want to conclude with this slide, uh, which is entitled Reflecting on Desert Urbanization in Egypt, which is the slide that, that the page that opens the last section of the book, um, as it is a sentence that I think sum up well what we attempted to do with this publication, uh, addressing a phenomenon in full swing currently, uh, as we have seen with the new capital. And in a way, the main line of research was to admit that architects and planners actually produce this environment uh, at the service of both the state and private investors, and that it, it is also our responsibility to address uh, this problem, problematic space production. Um, and with this research, we also tried to understand not only what went wrong, but also aimed at possible directions for um, ongoing desert development. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Charlotte. As you promised, exactly 30 minutes. <laughs> A quick, quick summary. Uh, what interests me is that, uh, I mean, you were extremely objective in the presentation of, of the material, and you restrained from criticism. Okay. At the very end, with the two projects, one, one began to get a sense that there is an inherent criticism. So, A, why, why did you choose to not enter into uh, the critique? I mean, knowing you, you're usually extremely critical of uh, nearly everything. Uh, and second, what, what are the critical issues that need to be foregrounded? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I decided not to jump too much in the, uh, in the criticism because um, I think that the issues behind are quite vast. Uh, I think to, for instance, jump into explaining how uh, the state is being, basically being robbed of its uh, of the value of the land because of this uh, notion of uh, property uh, that are that is with the uh, Ministry of Defense. So the Ministry of Defense has the land. It actually sells it for bargain prices to private companies that are then giving the work to. Uh, construction firms that belong to the military um, is a bit like opening a can of warm. You know, it's a, it's quite a large. But would you generally agree that one should build on desert land rather than agricultural land? Mm, no, actually, I think that the development on on informal, like the informal development on agrarian land, should be planned and controlled, rather than. But, but not on agricultural land. No, it 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 is already happening. It should be controlled and designed. I don't think that the answer is the desert cities. Personally, I think that's a mistake. You do? I do. Uh, Leo, because I disagree with you, but... <laughs> um, I mean, this is not really a criticism, but it's maybe more of an observation that, that I found very interesting when we came there, because as you see in the numbers, uh, in a way, there is no need for all of these cities. No, I mean you have you have um, housing goals of uh, five hundred thousand, and then you end up with thirty thousand residents. So um, it's maybe a little bit by the. I mean, the construction that is happening is just way too big. And when we went there for the first time and saw this, we somehow realized that it is 
kind of real estate bubble, but a very different one from from uh, our Western real estate bubble, which always is somehow um, based on on uh, interest rates and and uh, people's inability to kind of pay back uh, the money they have loaned. And in Egypt, you kind of it seems like this is the only kind of investment you can do is to somehow build a house uh, that that uh, you are hoping uh, your grandchildren will be able to rent to someone or whatever. Um, but just because they don't have a system of loaning money and then building, but they kind of pay it in cash, uh, you have this, n not kind of a real estate bubble, but like something like a real estate cancer that is just spreading. And it, it's basically the only way of investing, I think. So you basically have a, uh, a country that is, is somehow too lazy, or like a, a kind of a government that is too lazy to, pro to start anything else, but this uh, kind of sad uh, thing that they're profiting from. Yes, right? but you have a very active government. You saw, we saw 10, 10, 10 cities. That's, I mean, give me another government that projects 10 cities on its territory, and, and the land is state-owned. Well, China is another story, which we'll, we'll thematize in another, in, another, in another seminar. But uh, in, in China, uh, the, the transfer of, um, of user rights, I mean, the land remains within the hand of, of uh, the, the Chinese people. Uh, but the, you, lease, you lease the land for a certain period of time, and this is how it enters the capitalist system. Here it's different. The, the land is, is owned by, by the government, okay, which, is, which is, I think, extremely interesting. And then it's being sold uh, quite cheaply, which I, I don't mind that, that, that uh, the government plays this role. It's a kind of subsidy, okay, saying let's activate that resource that, that we have because they don't need it for anything thing else. Uh, and they bring it back into, into the market. What I'm hearing from you in your presentation is that in Heliopolis, one of the first ones, a tram was built. So a, a clear connection was established between the core and the city and the new city. Between the lines of your presentation, I read that there is a transport problem, okay? that the cities are, are isolated. Uh, additionally, they are using certain, certain plan patterns uh, that are not necessarily, be, I mean, that really need 500,000 people to, to activate it. And you cannot activate those cities with only 30,000. So there is an issue of population, I mean, there's a, a population question to me. Uh, because, and this is where I disagree with you, I think you should not build on agricultural land. Okay, I, I think mean, it was. <clears throat> no, you, you're right about the mobility. It's but this is related to the fact that there is no real interest to have these cities actually populated because they are just products, right? They are built to be uh, real estate products. So it doesn't matter if they are inhabited or not. And also there is a certain idea that some of them are actually um, up, upper class. So knowing that only 11% of the Egyptians have a car, the fact that these cities are not uh, connected with affordable means of transportation automatically make them segregated cities, right? So you, you can't access them if you don't have a car. I mean, we, we also mentioned um, the, the case of public housing that has been built in 6th of October, for instance, where uh, people are actually not ha able to, they don't have a car and there is no public transport, so mothers bring their child to the, uh, to the school with a tuk-tuk, and uh, they stay there the whole day and they wait to pick them back because they can't afford to drive back. So it's also a kind of unjust urbanism that is at, at play there. Um, and then your, on, your, on your commentary of uh, building on agrarian land, of course, one should not build on agrarian land. That's, agree. I completely agree with you, but it is currently happening and it's not something that a, the government is not even addressing the topic, as you said, the book example, the fact that plans uh, that show this development are being, you know, considered, uh, I don't know, problematic, um, is very uh, illustrative of the attitude of the government towards the whole question. So one should not build on agrarian land, but one is building on agrarian land. And the, the pace and the problematic, uh, you know, product that results 
um, should be addressed uh, by planners. So th that's also something we tried to do with the first book where we were saying, if this urbanization has to happen, it, it could happen in a way that, you know, there is more public space, there is infrastructure plan, because currently that's not the case, right? So, yes, one should not build on a grand land, but it's happening anyway. So, uh, in that sense, it's, it's a, a, a planner's question. It's, it's happening. Okay, we're getting closer on, on, on the subject matter. And what I enjoyed about your presentation is that you said, let's transform them. I mean, the two examples that you showed at the very, very end propose the transformation of those desert cities. Uh, one with a transformation uh, of, uh, of, of one of by bringing in agriculture in, into those uh, territories and informality okay, in something that is highly formalized. And the second scheme addressed the, the creation of edges uh, to specific neighborhoods and densifying those suburban uh, enclaves. Okay, those, so I appreciate the fact that, that there is a transformation strategy uh, and particularly interesting is the fact that you, you know, one of the scheme proposes to appropriate all the techniques of the informal sector and bring them into something that is highly formalized. I think that's, that's an interesting uh, strategy. Now, if you, we go back to the themes of our seminar, Territory, Anthropocene, and Ecology. Territory you have addressed. Okay? This, is, this is a reconfiguration of Cairo in the last 30 years uh, based on the ring road, on the building of all these cities, and the newest endeavor is, is uh, the new, new capital with new actors that are coming to the game, such as Chinese investors, which I think is new uh, for Egypt. You, know, you, you find it a little bit on the, the Suez a corridor, but this is truly, truly new for, for, for Egypt. Um, Anthropocene. So let's, let's highlight that term. Uh, maybe I can uh, continue since this was also my first question. <laughs> so how, how does the project uh, tie in with uh, uh, the theme of the, of the lecture series? And uh, I can say that um, um, I mean, Egypt, as, as your PhD has shown, is extremely resource constrained. And it's one of the countries that we really go to when we move on to make a point, right? That there is a limit. No? And uh, uh, we see probably limits uh, in various um, um, let's say, uh, on, on various criteria. One of them is the water. Desert cities are constrained by the availability of water. This also agriculture in the desert, by the way, you know, the, the uh, presence of the groundwater or the, or the Nile water. So, so in a way, water is the first limit. The second limit is, uh, you know, apart from the kind of uh, mobility and social inequality and the government strategies in terms of diversifying, mixing populations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, providing better typologies, designing better, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are, in a way, uh, uh, apparent mistakes, but the more more tricky mistakes uh, also have to do with uh, with energy, with enormous kind of energy needed to climatize those cities. I think that that uh, temperature of plus 50 degrees is, uh, is a normal, is the new normal, and it, it's, I think in the world of plus three degrees where we are currently on, on, on the trajectory to, the question is really to, I mean, whether, I'm curious whether, whether your project, you know, shows to what extent are these area even habitable and, you know, for, for what kind of duration, et cetera, et cetera. So how are such uh, extremes going to be tackled in a kind of a long-term view of these settlements? I, I have also seen um, this morning, I mean, Alexandria is on, on the list of cities that will uh, be flooded. Mm -hmm. And I think this, this scenario affects three million people. In, in the Nile Delta, but what does it mean on Egypt as a whole, right? As a kind of a stability of, of uh, uh, economy, uh, political stability, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this kind of a more challenging long-term scenario of 
basically climate climate change. You know, I think. Perhaps that that could even be a topic for you know for for one for, for the next book. I, I wonder I wonder how um, how uh, you know what um, what you learned about it. I mean I think Leo can also answer on that, but I, I can mention that there is one um, one for instance one top one project. Um, kind of reverted to more sustainable ways of um, living that we're very much uh, tapping onto, uh, you know, passive passive architecture and, and uh, you know, courtyard ventilation systems and so on. So it is a topic that we were addressing at the scale of the architecture. Um, but at, at the scale, I mean, the territorial scale, of course, is, is very bleak, I would say, because um, the there is a, an appeal to, to work on desert city because as I tried to explain for Egyptians, this idea of being sitting on a very constrained land, um, of course, is, is, um, is uh, I mean, the fact that suddenly the desert become habitable is of course a, an incredible promise, right? So it's, it's like suddenly you don't have to live in this like traditionally constrained Nile Valley and so on, even though people actually don't want to live there. So I think there is maybe a, an interesting question if people are actually going to live there on the long term. Some people say yes, that there will be on a, on a 20 year span <clears throat> a move to, this, uh, to these desert cities that are uh, totally unsustainable in terms of uh, water and energy consumption. I mean, they just pump directly from the Nile. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, the new capital is also uh, taking water from the Nile. It doesn't, there's no, it, there's no aquifer at this point. So uh, it's, it's not, um, it's unsustainable on the long run. So in terms of territorial um, and, and uh, global uh, development, it's, it's very bleak. I, I, I have to admit that this is something that we, I mean, we try to tackle the more urgent, like as a planner, you know, in our lifetime, if you can do something about this development, how, how do you actually address that? Uh, knowing very well that um, if if the if you're looking at, at uh, maybe not so long so long time span, you're actually confronted with like the, like situations where these cities cannot sustain, like they will just well, be what abandoned. Sun? What about the sun? Sun sun energy. Yeah, they, they have so much sun. Yes. But is it? Uh, is, I think that we also reached a point where we know that sun-powered uh, um, uh, devices are also not that sustainable, right? That the way they are produced, the way they are kind of... I know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fact. And sun power, sun will not replace water. I mean, you, you cannot, I mean, the, the, I think the clear, very clear problem of this area is water. Water is... is uh, it's like something that's very, uh, very problematic. But maybe Leo has has more insights. Yeah, no. I mean, coming back to your point, I think going, as, especially to these two different places, the desert city and informal settlements, which are very dense, you you immediately feel that the density, in a way, is is good for the climate uh, in in such conditions. No, the desert city doesn't work. Uh, without air condition. You basically can't walk in the desert city. You can walk in the informal settlement, it's fine. I mean, of course, it comes at the price of this uh, um, super density, but on, on an urban level, and I think the students also immediately felt that, you see it also reflected in the first project that went back uh, to the density of, of, of those informal settlements just because you had the feeling, hey, uh, this is a streetscape in which I can operate, even if it is 50 degrees, um, which is completely impossible in, in the informal, uh, in the in the formal desert city. Yes, Neon, I agree. I mean, the informal settlements are, are basically too dense, ultimately, particularly those that are now 15 stories, 12 to 15 stories uh, height, and the desert cities are not dense dense enough. So, if, you know, you, you, if you talk uh, with the, the Ministry of, of Housing in Egypt, they are very aware of these problems. Those are not dumb people. They are running a country. And there is a Minister of uh, Sustainability, okay. a woman. Uh, were you in contact with them to see what they want to do? Because 
Sustainability is a big term that is now used in all these developments. Okay, the, the new capital is even called green. Okay, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, no. For, give, give a first. Uh, I, I, uh, Let's go with seniority. Uh, coincidentally, I, I also have uh, something on the, along the similar lines. So, so I'm, uh, uh, you know, what, what I'm really impressed about to, to speak about the kind of performativity of the project in those circumstances, right? So, so you are, you are a, a, a group from ETH, you, you, you have an MAS studio, you put in a way extraordinary resources in the realm of research and teaching that are rarely assembled, you know, anywhere in the world, you, you bring them uh, in form of projects, in form of a book, no? And of course, uh, this has the potential to uh, influence that uh, let's say governmentality to to open up uh, uh, you know certain um, uh, you know new new exactly. new inquiries new practices etc. So even the fact that that your book was stopped at the border, I would say, is a good sign because it shows that somebody was studying the material. Yes, and then we have <laughs> colleagues. We have colleagues at the. American University of Cairo and other universities in Egypt that yeah. are now tackling the issue of informality, which yeah. I think is, 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 yeah. is fantastic. Uh, exactly. And they are taking the research further than we did, which is also exactly. good, okay? because they have not, exactly. uh, you know, local knowledge that we do not have. Yeah. The, the interesting thing is that on the issue of the desert cities, and I, I, I believe, yeah. very much believe so, uh, that this is where the emphasis needs to be put. Okay, that the, the transformation of these desert cities. We don't necessarily new, need new desert cities, but they need to be transformed. Uh, and uh, it would be very interesting to see whether our colleagues uh, in Cairo uh, would, would agree with us or not on that subject matter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so yeah. your experience, what, what, what is the possible impact of such projects? You know, how, if, if we were to do such projects further in the future, and I think we should, and I, I have to say I'm also trying in my studio, and, and I even, even have this kind of a, a goal, let's say, or commitment in telling my students not a single line should be wasted just to educate ourselves. We should be working on projects that are oriented vis-a-vis a kind of actual situations and engaging with actual institutions, people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no. So how how do you think we can improve on these type of work? So I, I want to give two two small examples. Uh, one is um, we were in touch with the Minister of Informal Settlements and Urban Renewal under LCC, yeah? under LCC. Under LCC in 2014. So we had. A letter. We had. Uh, we actually had a meeting, um, and uh, she saw our models. She was uh, very interested and everything. And then the government was. Uh, the cabinet was dissolved. There was a new cabinet, and the Ministry of uh, Informal Settlements and uh, Urban Renewal was cancelled, and transformed into a sub sub secretariat of the Ministry of Housing which meant we had no more uh, interlocutor we were. Uh, so this maybe puts, uh, um, I think, explains a bit the Egyptian context, which is no, but not it also explains easy. that you have to enter top down okay, in Egypt. But go, I, go ahead. Again, I will disagree, if I may. Because um, this is not something that is related to Desert City. But for instance, the work that we've been doing in Egypt since 2000. So 13, I also because of my research, I've been engaged uh, there since 2013, going there with students once, twice, three times. We also did research with the smaller groups. We went there. We uh, also established a good relation with uh, people from the informal settlements. And uh, there is currently a, a project ongoing of, of building one unit. So that's kind of uh, in the pipeline. It's a little bit unclear yet how the financing will go because it's difficult to transfer funds to Egypt. But I would say that that's one 
So that's not the top-down version, that's the bottom-up version where um, you try to modify one unit that could then perform as something a little bit uh, prototypical, where people would see, because that's how it currently works. Uh, there, is, there are layouts that are circulating in the informal settlements and that's how people build their houses. They just look at another example that they like and they build that. So if you're able to, to change that, and the idea was always to offer something that has more public space because that's a, a very uh, dire issue in the informal settlement, that you could actually change uh, things at the larger scale. But that's the bottom up. At the level of the, the top down, um, uh, if you're able to engage with officials, which is very difficult, then I also think that it's possible to address uh, certain changes. But I think that the approach that we have to say, um, I, th I think the second approach of the project I was showing is more successful because it doesn't challenge the status quo of the financial scheme, which is to say Egyptian needs uh, it's, it's homes. Designed. It's designed. It's just designed, but in a way it's, it's a bit like a Trojan horse. It, it suggests that there is, a, there is a possibility of living together that is much more... Um, uh, efficient than today. But when you say living together, you mean different classes. Yes, this is very difficult in Egypt. Yes. Um, but I think one very crucial point, and this is <clears throat> always about uh, the limits of planners and architects, is that a city like 6 of October, uh, there is in the pipeline since I think 25 years uh, a metro line project, and that, that's just not happening because of this segregation uh, problem that people don't actually, uh, they think that the metro will bring, uh, you know, power, or like poor people, and that's something they don't want. No, but they have the factories there, and the factories of 6th of October have been quite, quite, quite good for the Egyptian yes. e economy, mm -hmm. uh, and they are working, and so when you, when you show these numbers, you say, you know, 500,000 projected, but only 30,000 live there, you need the same statistics for the working population because the working population is much higher and it currently is moving from the informal settlements uh, along the Nile to these. Uh, so there is a flow of people uh, that if you really want to be sustainable could, you know, could, could be established. All right, let's open uh, the floor for questions. No, first Melissa and then floor for questions. Sorry, because uh, this is uh, such an interesting challenge uh, uh, as a, as a teaching challenge, right? So, so as a, uh, among us, uh, I think the, the interesting question is also uh, how this book comes as a product of uh, MAS course, right? What does it mean? Uh, how many students do you Okay, have? so you're talking about the method of how to I'm produce talking, such a I'm book. I'm talking okay. about the method and I'm yeah. talking because uh, uh, Charlotte has something fantastic and, uh, you know, you, of course, you, you are the creators of this course, right? And uh, I, uh, I'm curious uh, just to, to reflect on, on, the, on, the, on this work as a, as a coursework, right? Mm -hmm. What is the, you know, how do you enjoy this method? How would you, would you refine it would you, and uh, would disseminate you, would you it? Change it? Would you, you know, okay. or, Leo, or, Leo you this know, is Leo's field. Yeah, I think we have always seen the, the book as a tool, no, uh, exactly uh, to do the things you, you were asking about in the beginning. How, how can you bring something back to the context? How can you ideally influence it? Um, and I think that works, um, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on the context. I mean, when we uh, did the books with Rainer in Brazil, I think the government was easier to approach than, than the Egyptian one, um, which why we also tried the informal way, kind of the Bob... Uh, 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 the bottom-up way in Egypt, which also kind of seems to be working, or seems to be a possibility at least. No? <clears throat> but I think the books are crucial but, um, in, in getting that attention. Um, but I think they're also really good in, in teaching the course. Um, I mean, operationally, it, it basically just works like that, that we, we, we 
do two semesters of work and we do a third where we kind of refine the work of of those two semesters uh, over the summer with the students. And that is, I think, um, especially for the MIS, a very fruitful method of kind of looking back at what you have done and... and uh, yeah, but there is something extremely exciting in, in, in this book is, is when it, it starts with observation, okay, where you, you, know, you go there and, and you record uh, what, what you see. And as, we, as you know, your class uh, suggests, every recording is a construction and, and you, you, know, you create maps of sites that allow you to foreground certain, certain uh, aspects. So there is a kind of reading of it, then there is a critical reflection on it, and there is always a design section. Okay, and the design section is about propositions, okay, where you say, you know, where, where shall it go uh, into the future? So there's a general trajectory from, from the past to, to the present with the critical analysis to a projection in, into the future. And that's the structure of the two books that, that you have there. But this is done from the beginning, and I would argue that the current MIS students are already in the process of producing the next, the next product which is, is the, it's also the portfolio that they can take home. Rainer, before you go, I know you have a flight to Berlin, so quick questions. Quick question, okay. Um, well, now there are a lot of things I'm thinking about, um, not only questions, but also really the impact that you can have. So first of all, maybe a comment before I come, before I come to a question. Of course, it's also about self-education. And it's always an outsider view what we are doing here, obviously, because we are not the locals. And somehow we have to be aware of it, the limits of being an outsider, and also the potentials. So uh, the potentials are uh, you have a certain distance, and so probably you can discover things that uh, the local colleagues might overlook. And I think this is a very important thing. Uh, you, as an outsider, you might also um, have as, as access to certain things where locals wouldn't have access because they are also um, kind of, um, let's say, influenced by power conditions and so on. So you have a, a more neutral view on that. And yes, maybe as a third aspect, uh, it's also very important with an outsider view to put it into context uh, with, with, you know, with, 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 other, with other phenomena that, that would be a phenomena outside uh, Egypt, for example. Uh, and here we, we, we are, I, I'm coming to the question which is also related to the topic of uh, the Anthropocene. Um, uh, Anthropocene means we have to look at the big picture. Uh, and now we are uh, thinking about the continent of Africa. The continent, uh, Africa as a continent, uh, will um, undergo massive transformations in the future. Uh, and I think the, uh, the question how to transform, uh, uh, how to create desert cities, is a question uh, which is obvious. No? If we think it's good or bad, but you know, we, we need to think about desert cities. Uh, so, um, whether it happens in Egypt or Sudan or, or Namibia, uh, it's, a, it's a very important question that it is addressed now, which is a, a lot related to energy. So, architects will not be able exactly to uh, give answers to these questions. But my uh, question would be, uh, what are the role models that are you know, underlying these things that are happening here? Did you check, uh, you, know, uh, you know, how far these dead, desert cities are related to other examples of desert cities? You know, where, you know, where are the com models coming from uh, that, you know, these, uh, you know, Egyptian planners are, you know, kind of taking as kind of granted for a, sust you know, a sustainable future of their country? Um, thank you for your question, Rainer. I think uh, you, you're absolutely right about the uh, exterior view. I think this is also something that we are very aware of. As you said, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a plus point as much as a weakness, so we, we also know that. Uh, for instance, for this book, what we always did, and we also tried to do that, is that when we were traveling, uh, we always had local students 
come with us. And for some of them, it was the first time that they actually went to informal settlements in Egypt. So in that sense, we are also um, conscious and we also try to make sure that we, you know, uh, integrate. Uh, to the second question. And then the second question, I think, uh, the example, I, I just want to to put one example out there. Uh, when I was mentioning the periphery uh, of Paris, uh, actually some of the models of these new cities are uh, almost contemporary with the Les Villes Nouvelles around Paris. So this uh, kind of modernist uh, inheritance um, is, is very clear in, in the way uh, the first cities were planned. So 6th of October uh, has very strict uh, um, zoning. It's, a, it's a very clear. You have residential, commercial, industrial uh, find Le zones. Exactly, you find Le Corbusier, the, uh, this kind of very rigid uh, um, construction. We looked at uh, a few other desert cities that we liked very much, but that were uh, only possible to mimic or to, let's say, uh, emulate to a certain extent, like uh, cities like Gardaia, for instance, in in uh, Algeria, which is uh, very organic and, and built in the 17th century, um, or Moroccan cities, or uh, examples from Iran as well, where you have uh, very very excellent modes of uh, sustainable uh, residential types um, that that are done to sustain an uh, incredible uh, amplitude of temperature from 40 plus to almost uh, minus 15 um, uh, as, as examples. Uh, but of course, this is very difficult to uh, bring in, in a model that is looking at, at the villa as, a, as the achieved typology. So uh, it, would, it would need a rethinking of, of um, let's say, the, the architectural and the urban output of, of new cities to, to actually bring these models into uh, full, you know, uh, into their full potential. Are you optimistic? Uh, yes, Good. very optimistic. Other questions? Thank you, Reiner. Yeah. Uh, firstly, congratulations to the team on the launch of the book. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, capital Cairo itself. And I understand the problems with the whole uh, planning and the problem with the commute and the prices being high and half of the population uh, currently living in Cairo don't even qualify for a housing loan and things like that. But my question is, uh, since the stakeholders want this idea to succeed, what are the policy changes uh, or incentives they are giving to people to kind of move from Cairo to the capital city? And I have a second part. So the second part is, let's say, let's assume this uh, succeeds and a large number of people kind of move to the capital Cairo. What does it mean for Cairo? What impacts? Uh, does it make things better? Does it decongest the place? And does Cairo become a better city than the capital Cairo now? Um, I can take the first and you take the second part. Um, so incentives, well, one of the strongest, uh, let's say, uh, selling point of the government is that uh, all the administrations will move. So uh, the fact that uh, the municipality, ministers, uh, ministries, uh, I think the, the presidential palace is also um, set to relocate, which also talks a lot about how unsafe uh, they feel in Cairo, the fact that you would actually want to relocate 40 kilometers away from the ancient cities and, and Tahir and all these questions, of course, is very interesting. But th this is a very strong move because by relocating uh, all the administration, you almost force, uh, and, and Egypt has a very important uh, uh, functionary body. There are a lot of people who work for the state. So the fact that... You earned, you earned well. You aren't okay, but yeah. you Middle you will move. Yeah. If you if you get an apartment, a new apartment, and your job is there, you will move. So I think that's a very strong incentive. But of course, we're talking, as Mark just said, about middle class people, people who who can who are uh, doing okay. But then, if you have ministries, you also generate a certain uh, life. I mean, people need to have lunch, you know, like this kind of question. So there is also a bit of a chance that some people would would look for. Uh, Jobs, but then there's no housing for these people, so they will 
temporary commute or build informal settlements. So again, you're, you're kind of... Uh, the, the, the problem remains the same as long as you don't tackle affordable housing for, for people. Second question, uh, Leo, was about the effects on Cairo. Yeah, I mean, I guess this one is maybe a little bit different than all the other desert cities that have been popping up uh, one after the other exactly because of this uh, fact that it uh, will move administration out into the desert. So maybe that will actually have a positive effect on downtown or the, the current kind of inner, inner city of, of Cairo in terms of traffic. Otherwise, the desert cities are kind of, it's really islands and usually there's one, one connection that leads you there or takes you away. So it's not somehow a very integrated system. Um, So I guess that ring road will be probably still very uh, congested and, and, and uh, the line that takes you out. Yeah. Was your question answered? Yes, it was. Yeah. It was. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Why do we, cons yeah. Why do we consider desert cities problematic? Maybe it's obvious, but uh, sometimes we go transparent. I think you. I think Milica partially answered on on, uh, on this question. You know, the the use of resources, the fact that this is, for instance, uh, the fact that you cannot live in a desert city without air condition uh, talks already about the the kind of the problematic use of resources, and the fact that uh, it's also problematic because, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, very segregated. So you're only. A, uh, offering housing f to a certain portion of the population, for instance. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think there is a... Of course, you, you can find all the problems you want to find. Uh, but if, if, if you say that you should not build along the kind of the fertile zone of, of the Nile, okay, which is, it is, you know, it is the source of the entire nation, uh, then you have to accept the desert cities. Then there's no other way. Then, <laughs> with for 90 million uh, inhabitants, you you will have to have to move to the desert. So the question is how to transform those entities into something that is more sustainable. And I think those are the strategies that that need to be pursued. The problem the problem is of course also <clears throat> where the attention of the government is placed. So there is a sense that it's a kind of elitist project that serves to, to, to relocate the elite, to, to give them uh, better conditions, to, to offer a new source of wealth. While at the same time, the kind of uh, urban problems in the city of Cairo are systematically neglected, right? So this is a problem. The problem is that it's a project which deepens inequality, which is um, uh, negligent. <laughs> you know, to award the resources that are already there. This is, I, I believe, also a big problem. Well, I, th I think going through the history of the desert cities, of, of Egypt. If you look at what happened in the big first wave with the Sadat, Sadat projects, those were modernist projects. Uh, these were in, uh, industrial engines in the desert with the workforce. This was not for an elite. Okay? This, was, this was for the nation. This was a nation-building project. What happened with, with what we see here in, in the image uh, of uh, uh, Palm Hill's development in 6th of October is that under the Mubarak regime, suddenly set the selling of, of land as a resource of it, you know, because you have, they had plenty of, of land, okay? uh, you know, selling it from, from the public sector to, to the private sector became a new source of, of income for the government, and the government was eager to, to, to find more sources of income. And so they entered into these new developments, you know, of the golf course communities and the shopping malls and the cineplexes, uh, uh, etc. Okay, which brings in, and then 
you know, some parts of the desert it is became parts of the for the elite. Okay, so this was not the origin origin of it. Yeah. The question has a lot of answers. It seems. Yeah, or not even. Yeah, I mean, uh, in principle, there's nothing wrong with the desert city. Desert city is a good thing. Um, the, the problem really is that that it is. Um, in a way, it's not even kind of uh, an urban development, but it is a financial product that is being perpetuated, which which serves the government and because they own the land. Yeah, the, the contemporary form uh, uh, in which it's developing now. No, um, that that's kind of my answer to that. All right. Other questions. Thank you so much for the terrific, uh, terrific presentation. Um, I'm curious, like, uh, when, when you're doing your PhD, like, what kind of research question and, or, like, what kind of needle eye, like, did you choose? Because you are facing, like, such a vast information, like the politics, the urban development, the energy, the resource, and uh, it's, like, contemporary going, and what kind of um, document uh, re uh, method did you choose? Question. Um, well, maybe what needs to be said is that my entry point uh, for my uh, dissertation is actually food. So uh, I actually, we, we um, let's say we ended up on these uh, informal settlements through the fact that uh, Egypt was being highly dependent on, on uh, global uh, wheat supply. So that, that the entry point was not directly the urbanization, but uh, a much larger, much more global question where you would see uh, this, this bread being, uh, you know, held uh, in demonstrations and you would be like, what, what, what has that to do with anything? And then kind of the link with the urbanization of agrarian land and the, the dependency of the nation on, on global food markets uh, was the, is actually the backbone of, uh, of uh, my research. The informal settlements are one case study out of three. Um, and then the desert cities, they fit in, a, in, in, a, in another case study which is related to uh, agricultural uh, land reclamation and how this, this idea of growing into the desert is not only related to urban development but uh, mostly to uh, agricultural production and how you would be able to uh, feed the nation. If you, so not only you would live in the desert, but you would be able to make the desert a productive uh, uh, field and, and be able to feed the nation with that, which is, of course, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, this kind of dream of, of going out of the limits of the Nile Valley and the Delta. So uh, with, with food as a, as a kind of um, uh, filter, I, I was able to address some of this... Uh, urban questions, which are very linked somehow. Other questions? Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was, we have heard uh, quite a lot about cities and making cities better. Well, question around mobility and access and segregation and city as a product. But I would be quite interested in the other point of the title. What about the desert? Is it always the same desert out there? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm actually, I'm not a desert specialist, I have to say. Uh, what I know is that um, there are, uh, there were areas where you have uh, water. Uh, there's, an, there's access to an aquifer, which actually is, suffers from being used in the case of desert cities. Um, the new capital, very interestingly enough, that's why it's called, uh, I think the name was Wadi, is actually um, built on a, 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 a former, so an archaeological remain of a, archaeology is the wrong term, but uh, an ancient uh, river, uh, riverbed. So it, it, it's very, it's kind of sloped and it has a, it has a, it has an interesting topography which makes it a bit different, I guess, than uh, the kind of flat, uh, clay, like most of the others are, are very flat, you know, there's kind of like desert, flat. It's, it's corresponding very much to the idea of the desert that you have, sand, uh, flat, pretty much. So the, the capital, the new capital is built on something that has a bit more of a challenging topography, which makes it interesting. But in terms of 
where we go, I think that that's something that we all know is that there is never nothing, right? This, this doesn't exist. The idea that we go this this Im imaginary that you go on somewhere and there is nothing that's actually not existing. So there is always something in these deserts. Uh, there are like uh, desert fauna and flora. There are also uh, people who are uh, actually transiting and things like that. So. But Egypt doesn't have, in this area, uh, Bedouin populations, or, or uh, if so, they have been uh, sedentarized a long time ago. So um, it would be interesting to, to investigate a bit further on what was there, but I, I'm sure there was something. That would be my uh, intuition. Well, it was fertile land. <laughs> At one, one point. <laughs> no, during the Roman period, it was fertile. There are big parts of the desert, and as we know, the Saharan region is, 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 is growing to the north due to the you know, water squares, uh, scarcity problems that we are encountering all over the globe. I mean, if you look at Israel, you, know, you can see the desert move in. And the question is you know, the degree of information that, that is inherent to a territory. Okay, so yes, we, you know, we can say there's various fauna and uh, different animals and nomads that go through it, but at the end, compared to the, the Nile Valley, it's, it's desert. Other questions? If not, I don't, one more, one more there. And this is the last question that we will take, so you have the final word. Oh. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, you were talking uh, about... Um, I was wondering about you spend some time talking about how the government doesn't quite like the book that much and I was wondering if you could go into some more detail about what the government actually makes of the informal settlements, what their official position on them is and how they like to market their desert cities. So not the critical architecture side but the official kind of state. Um, I mean I, I think I, I, I partially answered I think the um, the government is uh, not uh, interested in the informal settlement. It's, it's illegal to build on agrarian land, and that's a position that has not changed since Nasser. So uh, if you want to build on agrarian land legally, it will take you something like 70 transaction, uh, seven to zero. Seven zero transaction to actually get a, a sort of a permit. It's very unlikely that you will get it. It's very expensive because you have to kind of uh, pay your way through, let's say, um, and, and, uh, and uh, you might not get uh, your permit in the end. So it's illegal, and because of that, the government has repetitively ignored any call of uh, legitimization and legalization of, of ownership. So people don't actually have ownership. They have uh, papers that say that they own one twenty-fourth of a piece of agrarian land, if they are lucky, so they do have some kind of tenure. Uh, during maybe there's an interest. There was an interesting time in uh, during the revolution, so around 2011. We know of a case of our uh, one of our research area, where which is uh, neighboring the ring road. So the ring road goes through, but there's no connection. Of course, it's just like cut it cutting through. So what they did is they rented a, a caterpillar and they created their own exits. They were like, okay, we will do that. And then they, invite, uh, they invited the governor of Giza to inaugurate the illegal uh, exits, which was, I think it, it happened. He came, he cut the ribbon, everyone was happy. And I think this was a time where it, it hinted towards a possible future that is now not happening, where the government would be willing to, to enter a kind of more uh, legalization and, and this, which unfortunately didn't happen, uh, and I think it won't happen now, recently. No, but I think, I think this last example is very important because it, it shows you that the, the threshold between uh, you know, the truly formal and truly informal uh, sector and that uh, the boundary is, is porous. Uh, you find on the Mumbarak, uh, with the help of the World Bank, uh, attempts to bring in infrastructure to the informal uh, settlements. You know, there were waves of, of uh, money flows that were uh, strategies of how to legalize uh, land. Okay? But at the same time, you know, the official answer is you are not allowed to build on agricultural land. So you get into these uh, extremely difficult, uh, amphibious 
uh, conditions, and I think you, 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 it's for us extremely difficult as Swiss people to operate in those systems, but if you're Egyptian, uh, it's, it's part of your life. Okay? You, you know that this is how you maneuver through, through the system, which you will also find in China. So it's a very, I mean, your question is, will become extremely important throughout the seminar uh, because it really allows you to, to bridge this very kind of simple dichotomy of formal informality. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, for your lecture. Leo, thank you very much for this beautiful uh, book. And uh, Melissa, you're going to be in charge of the next session in two weeks after the seminar week. That's right. Please come. Great. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks.